Hi, I'm Harper Simon. Welcome back to Talk Show. Today we have with us uh, one of the uh, founding members of the band Devo. He's an artist and a film composer and probably one of the most original thinkers in the history of the counterculture. Mark Mothersbaugh, thanks for coming on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Was that a comp complimentary introduction? Yes. <laughs> um, can I ask you, um, well, anyway, we're all thrilled to have you here because everybody here is such a Devo fan and grew up with Devo, and um, they were so important to me in my formative years. Can we talk a little bit about the formation of Devo, the early years of Devo, which started a lot earlier than most people I would think, really, actually, in the early 70s. Well, the truth is we are as old as we look. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, um, we were art students. Uh, and I met Jerry Casale at Kent State in uh, the late 60s. And we uh, collaborated on some a couple art projects first before we he was a grad student and I was a sophomore when we met uh, and um, he was curious about this guy that was putting up graffiti art around the school of uh, astronauts on the surface of the moon holding potatoes and he wanted to meet that guy and, and I'd heard in my English class I'd heard the teachers complaining about this uh, smart ass student that was like uh, doing um, acid porn. He was writing acid pornography, and I'm like, what would acid pornography be? I didn't know what that could be, what but was it? it sounded interesting. <laughs> and so, uh, so anyhow, so we ended up meeting and talking, and he wanted to know why I was interested in potatoes, and um, it started a conversation and a dialogue, and we ended up um, uh, collaborating on some visual things, and then uh, um, he, um, it was uh, like uh, 1969 by then, and um, he said, hey, there's some interesting um, classes that they're teaching uh, in the grad student department, and um, you should try and get in there. And I'm like, well, I'm only a sophomore. But I, I found that they were, it was the first year they were using computers to to sign up for classes at Kent State in, in 1969. And so all I had to do was like check the box that said, have you, have you fulfilled all of the prerequisites to take this class? And the computer didn't have enough back information to, to check on it. And so they let me in all, I started taking grad student classes back then. And, and so um, I got in the same classes, some of the same classes with Jerry and um, met interesting people, including uh, Chuck Statler, who ended up um, directing the first all, Devo film. All your video, uh, and now there's a film that I've never seen that's even before, that's probably some, I guess that's years before the, the music videos or Jocko Homo or the first album, right? Um, there, there's, all, there's different film, short films and well, different there, projects pre-musical Devo. Uh, well, yeah, yes, yes, and, and sort of. Um, uh, we, were, we were art students, and we weren't really thinking of ourselves as a band back in those days yet. We were, we were, um, we were thinking, we were like, well, there was Art Deco, there was Art Nouveau, now there's going to be Art Devo, and we were, you know, we were... Um, going to be like Akron, Ohio's version of the factory, you know, like Andy Warhol's factory. But we were going to be in a real factory town, so we were an honest factory, you know, art factory. So we were, you know, we, um, you know, we 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 thought of ourselves as kind of agitprop and um, and uh, performance art and and. Uh, what were some of the other art movements uh, that you were influenced by, or who were you looking at uh, at that time? I mean, besides Warhol and what was going on up in New York. Well, well we, you know, I think you know we loved everything that was happening in Europe between World War One and World War Two. Uh, you know, 
we were fascinated with, you know, Dadaism, the Dadaism and surrealists, and, surrealists yeah. and the futurists and uh, the Russian suprematists, you know, like, um, you know, like Victory Over the Sun, that, that play, I don't know if you ever heard about it. It, it actually got performed in, in the U.S., uh, in L.A., actually, at LACMA in 1980, one of the few times it's ever been performed outside of Russia. And, um, uh, you know, um, that we were fascinated by, by the energy and, and that kind of uh, intellectual activity. And we wanted to apply that to our culture. And it just happened that while we were at school, um, we were interested in protesting the war in Vietnam. And were you at Kent State when the shootings happened? Were you a student there at that time? Yeah, um, that was 1970, and uh, spring of 70, um, uh, we were, you know, we were there for the, uh, the, um, the shootings. Um, Jerry was standing fairly close to one of the girls that got killed, and uh, I think 30-some kids got shot and four kids died. And, and, you know, they shut down the school, so we couldn't really go to classes. And um, Jerry would come over to my place, and we'd play music together. Um, he was in a blues band at the time, and I was in almost a prog rock band, but it was kind of, I was into electronic. I was into... Uh, I was into things like uh, Morton Sabotnik, and I had a, an early Minimoog. I had one of the first Minimoogs, uh, and, um, and uh, uh, I, John Cage, I liked that kind of stuff. And I was really interested in all the early electronic music that was out. And um, like so we Terry were, Riley was that were you was that happening at that? Sure, th sure, all, all that stuff. And and so so we would so. We would get together and play music together, and um, we made jokes that it was kind of like um, Flintstones meets the Jetsons. And um, we, I was looking for thing, sounds that were that um, kind of like the futurists were back in, in the 20s, where the futurists said that the modern orchestra does not have the instruments that properly um, convey the spirit of the industrial culture. And, and so they added like fog horns and um, airplane motors and things like that to their, to their um, instrument um, armory, I mean artillery, when they played uh, music. And they scored music for fog horns and things like that. And, and I guess also the, you know, even the, the Beatles were doing that to some degree. Right? In their own way, yeah. The Beatles were always looking for something new. You're right. Um, and uh, so, so, um, so I was I was watching you know the news, and I was watching you know the you know like uh, bombers dropping Agent Orange on on Vietnamese villages, and and you know so I I was looking for the sounds of V two rockets and mortar blasts, but also the sounds of uh, of Pepto commercials, and I was looking for the the right sound of what Alka-Seltzer should sound like when it goes through the body or goes through the brain. And um, I wanted to put all those things together with, um, with Jerry's like primal uh, blues beats. And, um, and, and we looked at what was going on around us and we decided that what we were observing wasn't evolution but was de-evolution. So um, that's how we came up with the name Devo. It was kind of a contraction of, of that. Um, you know, we tried more clumsy things like um, sextet devo when we play, so that we could get into a jazz festival at Kent, we, and uh, the de-evolutionary army, which sounded just a, a little too, too confrontational. And then devo just seemed to work out best. It sounded just sounded like, like we could be a Costco or something. Right. You know, it sounded like a, like just a corporate entity, which was kind of uh, appropriate for us. Yeah, and which you, you, you appropriated, uh, actually. Um, I, th I feel like there's a, a, a lot of concepts and an aesthetic and, uh, that must have come together kind of 
quickly that 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 comprise Devo because there's uh, so many there's such specific iconography and costumes and um, the kind of space age um, space age iconography and sounds with uh, a kind of biting subversive social satire and protest. I mean. You guys must have really been brainstorming a lot to come up with such a complete con construct. Well, well, to our advantage was the fact that we were, it was both, it worked against us, we thought, but it was actually working to our advantage that we were uh, in this um, cultural wasteland on this, in this island called uh, Akron, Ohio, where, where nobody paid attention to us or knew who we were. And... Um, uh, it gave us a lot of time to um, to uh, to work out ideas and concepts, and so so we we were we were kind of Devo for like about five or six years, and we we made our first recordings, and we wrote a lot of music, and and uh, did a lot of artwork, and and put together uniforms and stage choreography and films, made films and put them in film festivals before we really got to leave Ohio and, and start driving to the East Coast and the West Coast. Then and, to do gigs. And perform. I mean, so by the time we got to New York, um, it was kind of fully formed. And um, were, you, were you looking at other bands at that time? Were you looking at like glam rock and Roxy Music and Ziggy Stardust and all these different sort of characters that were kind of coming into rock oh, yeah. and roll. I, I mean, mean, sure. We, you know, um, I mean, I remember hearing the first Roxy Music uh, album and um, there was a song, it was pretty great lyrics on it and the songs were all really amazing songs, but, but there was one song that was kind of a throwaway song and it was called Editions of You. It, it was like a B-side, if anything. It was not really an important song, except that there was a solo on it that when I heard it, it made the hair on my arm stand up because whoever was the keyboard player on this song, they had found a way to get the sound I was looking for. I'd been it was watching... was Brian Eno, wasn't he? It was he Brian would, Eno, yeah. and I didn't know who he was until then, and so I, 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 I you know, had to find out who this guy was because he had done something that I didn't know... I, I could not figure out how he had gotten his synthesizers to sound so liquid and so rubbery. And I was trying to get away from keyboard sounds because there were like all these people like Rick Wakeman and uh, Keith Emerson who were, who made their... It's kind of virtuoso prog rock like, move Yeah, it playing, just sounded like uh, um, glorified organs, you know. It sounded like a calliope that was just a little bit kookier than a calliope. And it was not, to me, not interesting. And, and uh, when I heard what Brian was doing, it was like... It was kind of rubbery, and I didn't know how he did it, and I, so I had to find it, find out what that was. And and because uh, before that, the only person that I really had liked how he played and what it sounded like was um, Sun Ra, and he played kind of like a baby. He played he played like this. We played a concert with Sun Ra, and I remember watching him and watching him play, and he played like On this, the but piano, but, but it was very, you know, it was just super atonal and uncontrolled. It was like, it sounded like a baby throwing a tantrum, most of it, you know. Although he could do rhythmic things, it was, it, it was super atonal. But, uh, so I really liked, but I liked his playing a lot. And, Me too. And, uh, but, but Brian Eno, I heard that and I said, that's, that's the closest anybody's come to like, uh, to like, um, Playing something as amazing on a keyboard as as Hendrix played on a guitar, and so I really wanted to to find that guy and to meet him. And, and then he ended up producing the, the the first Devo record. So how did that come about? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Um, well then, then when we started playing in New York, it's you know it's like we, by the time we got to New York, we were you know we already had we had found these. Uh, yellow suits in a in a janitorial supply catalog, and and they were like three fifty a piece. They were like hazardous waste cleanup suits, and we just put a piece of like gaffer's tape around our waist, and we took like 
vinyl stick-on letters and put them on our, that's spelled out Devo, you know, right here. And we could, they were so hot, you know, we couldn't wear them all night. So we'd rip them off after about, you know, like an hour. Oh, right, that's and, where they then, uh, have to have the other outfit beneath, right. the so shorts and everything. Right, then we'd have these, like, 50s gym sh yeah. outfits on that looked, you know, super nerdy. And we'd, Such we'd a great our, um, stage maneuver. I mean, it's like a, it's like a sort of funny showbiz, like, it's almost like a... James Brown showbiz maneuver or something. <laughs> but, but Brian came to a Devo show at Max's Kansas City with Robert Fripp one night. And, and after, the, after the show, uh, they invited us over to Robert's house and, and said they wanted Where were you to, playing? At CB's or something? Uh, or Max's? Max's. Or? Max's. And, um, and afterwards they said, um, hey, if you, know, if you, if you want to work together, we'd love to work with you. And... and I said, well, I'd always, I always, you know, if, I, I'd done in interviews. I'd said I, Brian Eno was my first choice to produce Devo, and David Bowie was my second choice. And um, Brian said, well, says, why don't we do an album together? And I said, well, I don't have a record deal. And he says, well, don't worry about it. I'll pay for it. And I said, well, okay. Where do we do it? And he goes, there's a studio in Germany. I like to work out and. Work at it, it called Connie Plank Studio in Neunkirchen, and uh, Kraftwerk worked there. A lot of uh, German uh, electronic and uh, you know people like Mobilius and Rod Rod Rodelius and Mobius worked there, and um, I think he did music for airports there, uh -huh. and uh, and uh, Noy used right. to work there, and Can right, all those and, guys. Uh, so, I see. I never really knew anything about that studio or where those bands were. So that's yeah, so he was our uh, patron saint, and uh, he flew. He us. brought you all there. He wasn't yeah, like, "Hey, let's just do it here in New York." He, we, I wonder why he uh, did it. Have incredible um, all that, all the technology you were looking for. Did it have great synths and stuff that he? Yeah, played? he he just he thought that was the place to work, and he felt comfortable there, and it was it was an interesting. It was an interesting experience. Uh, David Bowie hung out with us the whole time. Did he contribute some ideas or? Yeah, uh, Bowie was fun to be around, except that him and Eno bickered the whole time, every, every, day at, every night at dinner, because uh, what album had they done? They had already Low. worked together. Pro oh, right. They just finished Low, and, and um, Eno felt like he hadn't gotten enough credit for his input, so they, every night, he just kept bitching to, to David about that, but, but um, he didn't feel like he should be having that conversation privately then. <laughs> he well, wanted was, to have it in front of was, all of you guys. But how, what an amazing atmosphere that you guys had. That, it was pretty great. I mean, yeah. but anyway, so you guys had all the songs already? Yeah, I, we, have, we had like about three albums worth of material already written by then. And... Uh, I mean, I think what is really remarkable here that I can't even, what seems uh, inexplicable is just that there was so much uh, musical talent, uh, unmined musical talent within this band that started off as an art project, art concept band that well, then turned kind into... kind of, kind of. It's like um, my brother was a, pretty good guitar player and Alan was a great drummer. He was a he was a jazz drummer before he played with Devo. He he wasn't in a rock band before. And Well you um, really got him to get rid of all that, didn't and, you? And I like... was a player but uh, but the Casales weren't really players and, and um and our songs were always pretty simple. They were they were basically they would have been good Albums for somebody who was learning how to play bass, guitar, or drums. It would be easy, easy albums to learn how to play your instrument with because the parts were always simple. Yeah, but they're very. Um, there's interesting time signatures in there, and there's a lot of it just. It's just a yeah, very were, innovative right. sounding couple, album. I mean, it's very unique, and there's signatures. nothing uh, really like it that I can think of at that time. Um, I mean, it's just. And it doesn't sound like Brian Eno to me either. I mean, it doesn't. Yeah, he would uh, say you know, that. I mean, you know, he. Um, one of my, uh, if I could 
<laughs> if he were here now with us, if he was sitting right here between us, I would, um, I would ask him, and he would probably say no, but I would ask him if he would let me give him the 24 track tapes back because I looked at them about 10 years ago. And you know, this is 1977, the winter of 77 that we recorded these tapes. But um, I, would, I was looking at them and, and every track, it was back in the days before uh, automation. So every track, he, there's, there's a piece of paper that has the name of the studio and it has all the tracks written down. And every one of them, there's in his beautiful handwriting, he has beautiful calligraphy, and in his handwriting, very neatly, for every track, for the drums, for every instrument, he wrote down all of the EQs, all of the effects, all of uh, the volume levels, everything, so that you could duplicate the settings of every instrument. But the thing I noticed was that he had, on every single track, recorded at least one or two synth parts of his own, and sang an extra track sometimes, you know, like harmony vocals on things. And I remember Just for himself, or was he wanting he to... He wanted them to be on. He wanted to and be on the record. some of them are on. Some of them are on, like on, on Uncontrollable Urge, and on Jocko Homo, and on Too Much Paranoias. I know they got on, and there's probably a few other ones. But I remember, I remember, and he was good enough to put up with this, we were so certain of what our album was going to sound like, and we were so protective about it. And, and at that time, we'd already had three or four people had in, had in Billboard magazine or Variety had already claimed that they were our manager, and they were sometimes people we had never met. And um, so we were very protective about everything, including what we sounded like. And so... so um, when it got down to doing the final mixes for the album, I remember, you know, Brian would sit in the middle and Connie, the engineer, would be beside him, and then we'd be standing around him, and there'd be the two speakers. You know, you know, you 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 know, you mixed albums before. You know what I'm talking about. So there's the two albums. So everybody's standing there, and they're all staring straight ahead intently, and you know, we'd work on it till you get the mix, and you go, okay, that's it. And so then when you get the mix and you agree on it, then. This is analog days, so then you hit the two-track machine to start it running, so you got the, you're recording the two-track. Then you hit the multi-track, so the 24-track's running now, so you're recording onto the two-track. But everybody's staring straight ahead, but I would do, or Jerry, either Jerry or I, would, would mute all his, looking straight ahead, his we'd tracks. reach up to Brian's tracks, and we'd be staring straight ahead and pull his tracks down like this. And out of the, I have no peripheral vision, but I, out of the corner of my eye, I could kind of see him go like this and look over. Oh my God, you didn't feel oh like you God. could just, you didn't want to get into a confrontation where you're like, and Brian, we, we don't totally, want that we were like backing totally, vocal track on the we album. We were kind of like these punky assholes. And he kind of just looked and he didn't say anything ever. Oh my God, through that the whole recording funny. session, He just kind of went, okay, whatever. And we did the whole album like that. But I always... Once I saw those tracks, I was like, oh, yeah. I would love it if he would want to say, show us what he thought it should have sounded like. Instead. Maybe there should be a, uh, a re, re imagine, you know, Brian Eno's mix yeah, of or, uh, Are We Not Men. And, and if he won't do cool. it, maybe the reimagined version yeah. of what it, what it would have sounded like if he, if he would have done it. Because I, I saw something recently where he said he... he he liked us, but he said we were difficult. I, I, I <laughs> well, yeah, if he kept taking his tracks he off. He didn't elaborate <laughs> on it, but he did say that we were difficult. I see. So uh, anyway, that album then, I mean, it must have just... Did you already have like a, a, quite a, a live following in the States from even before the album came out? Uh, not really. No, I mean, but you, it was... You, we, we had... Uh, what happened is while we were recording that, we had, we had made a single like about three or f months before that. And um, it had Jocko Homo on one side and Mongoloid on the other, and we'd put it out. We, we'd pressed a thousand of them up and um, made a cover and, and uh, distributed them ourselves on Boogie Boy Records. And what that meant is that... Um, I'd get in a car once a week and I'd drive up to Cleveland from Akron and I'd go into a record store and go, 
hey, need any more Devo records? And the guy would go, let me see. And he'd go down to the end of the line and he'd go, there'd be a box, you know, that said other stuff. And then he'd go and he'd go, nope, I got the one you brought in last week. And then I'd go, okay, I'll see you next week. <laughs> then I'd go to the next store. Uh -huh. and, um, uh, but during that, after it'd been out like a couple months, you know, and we'd sold uh, probably maybe 50 of them or something. Uh, uh, Somebody started to play them. Robinson, what was his name? It was the guy that was the head of um, Stiff Records. I think his name was either, I think his name was Robinson. Anyhow, um, he, he went into Bleaker Bob's and found one and he called us up and he said, do you guys have any more of these? Do you have any other songs? We go, well, we just did something with Bomp Records out in uh, California. We're going to do um, Satisfaction, the Rolling Stones song. We had a Satisfaction single we were doing. And he goes, do you have any other songs? We go, yeah, we got lots of stuff. And he said, we got a song called Be Stiff even. And he goes, what? And it was Stiff Records. So yeah. he said, I want to put that out. He didn't even care what it sounded like. He wanted to put out Stiff Re Be Stiff. So. He said, I just want to distribute them. I don't want to, I'm not going to own them. I'm not going to do anything other than just distribute them in Europe. And so we said, okay. So he distributed three singles. And Stiff had like the Damned and maybe yeah, Nick Elvis. Lowe or Elvis Costello or maybe the early, had, like, uh, were those they guys? They had Lydia Lunch and... Oh, uh, Lydia Lunch. That's uh, New York. I thought they were all English, English acts. And uh, Stiff. Yeah, they, they had a, a number of, um, they had... Um, Ian Drury, I don't know, had a right. bunch of people. Anyhow, so all I know is we were in, so it's like uh, the winter, winter in Germany, and somebody comes in that they were finishing recording on our album that doesn't have a record deal yet, and they come in with a Melody Maker, and they hold it up, and they go, look at this, and we're on the cover of Melody Maker, and we're like, Wow, how'd that happen? And there's a picture of us at the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Museum. We're standing in front of a, we're in our yellow suits, act, uh, we're in front of this display acting like we're working in, a fac in the factory, at the rubber factory, like we're um, turning dials on a machine or something. And uh, David Bowie is in the corner in set and he's going, this is the band of the future. Wow. And so... So well, David Bowie got you that, that big piece of press, basically? Well... What happened is the three singles, uh, Satisfaction went into the top 10. It went like number, up to number three or four in, in uh, England. Jocko Homo, God bless it, went into the top 10 in uh, Scotland, which somehow. <laughs> That's incredible. Uh, Jocko Homo. And then, uh, and then uh, it went number one in Yugoslavia, that wow. single. And, and Mongoloid went number one in. Mon in uh, France and that's a beautiful and, uh, that's a beautiful thing and yeah and and <laughs> different songs charted all over all over Europe and they were all just these things on stiff records and um, so they said you guys want to before you go back to the states you want to stop in England and play some shows so so we did we played um, Eric's of the Eric's uh, used to be the the cavern where the Beatles played and then uh, we played. Um, Manchester, and we played um, Hammersmith, Odeon. So. so just to say, so what year is this? Seventy. So I think it had. This it was seventy-seven. Or Seventy-eight. It was just. It was like either December or January, something like so, that. So I mean, really, it's so just like seventy-seven punk rock in its first incarnation is in absolute full yeah, effect. We were. I mean, so were you? You obviously felt a camaraderie with those. Act. It was interesting. It was like, uh, I remember um, Eric's, that, that club was, it was definitely a punks club. It was like, and it was like this place where you, we never saw what the club looked like because you played inside a cage that went from the floor to the ceiling and you were in a, like a square cage and there were kids hanging on the cage. So we never saw past the kids that were hanging floor to ceiling on the cage. And it was the time, and it was kind of confusing because it was the time of gobbing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Luckily, we had our yellow suits, but but you know the the lights were hot enough that they turned into like stalactites almost instantly from the heat. Jeez. So, so it was um, it was kind of a crazy. 
And did you go, on, were you on bills with any of the other, or did you play with the We just did three solo or, shows, uh, and, and, then went, and then went back to um, Akron, Ohio, and then, um, then there was a, a little stream of uh, record companies flying over. I remember, um, uh, God, what's his name, from um, Black, Blackwell? Chris, Chris Blackwell. Blackwell. I remember him calling up and saying, hey, I'm coming over to see you guys. And it was winter, you know. And he got off the plane. Oh, he, he came all, wanted to come all the way to Akron. He then. came to Akron. But he, but he had to go to the airport in, in Cleveland. And I had a car that didn't have any back rear windows. So I showed up at the airport to pick him up. And it's like snowing. And he just came in from Jamaica. I don't know what he thought. He th I don't know if he thought I was going to pick him up in a limo or something. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he shows up and he gets off the plane in shorts and and uh, and um, little sandals and a and a you know like a little shirt that's you know like a Hawaiian shirt or something. And first thing we had to do was drive to a, like a Kmart and get him a coat and pants. <laughs> so he wanted to put Devo on Island then, I guess. Uh, but that's yeah. not and where you ended up. What was his up. label then? I forget what his label was called. Was it Island? Yeah. Yeah. So what was the label that put out uh, Are We Not Men in America? Uh, it was Virgin in Europe, and it was uh, Warner Brothers in the U.S. So um, then you had already had all this hype and David Bowie and European exposure and charting. So I guess then the U.S. quickly jumped on board. and Well, they, they didn't know what to do with it in the U.S. Uh, we, we, you know, it's like we went to our... Warner Brothers, they, I'm not even sure why they, I think they signed us because Bowie uh, wanted us to sign to his production company and, and it ended up not working out. Bewley Brothers, he wanted us to sign with them and it, somehow it didn't work out to do that. But, so they thought, well, okay, we'll sign him for the U.S. And because um, Virgin Records didn't have a, a, a distribution deal in the U.S. yet. So, so um, and I like I unfortunately liked, uh, um, uh, what's his name, uh, the Virgin Records? Richard, Richard Branson. Richard Branson. Yeah, I liked Richard Branson because we were all like in our early 20s. And, and the Sex Pistols were on Virgin and they were doing yeah, fun I liked, stuff. Yeah, I liked the Sex Pistols and, and he had signed them and I thought, well, that, he must be a good guy, but he, he, he was, you know, early on tr just trying to be a billionaire, so... I was just one of his early, like. Uh, and did you uh, <laughs> did you did you guys then did you come back up to New York and get, were you welcomed by the kind of CB scene and television and Talking Heads and all these bands that really seemed quite you know somehow would relate to your yeah, art uh, yeah, aesthetic. College, yeah, the college uh, crowd liked. You know, we, we played. We played um, theaters and bigger shows in college cities and and outside of college cities, though, because uh, because we could get on. We were on the radio in college cities, but we we hadn't broke on the mainstream radio yet. Cause Was Satisfaction a like a hit song? And not in the U.S. No, no. Um, it wasn't. It really wasn't until our third album that we that we had a hit in the U.S. And and uh, but we we did have kind of some. Some kind of notoriety because uh, on that first tour before we finished it, uh, we got asked to be on Saturday Night Live, and it was the early. It was like the second year, maybe or third season. I think it was the second season of Saturday Night Live, and um, it kind of was different enough, you know that. We did Satisfaction, and we did um, Chocohomo. Well, I have to tell you that I was actually in the audience there as a six-year-old That's child. impossible. You were a, you could you couldn't even <laughs> have been a fetus. <laughs> and, a no, I was five or six years old, and I was there, and it was such a big, formative, musical moment for me. I was so thrilled by Devo. Um... I talked about, you know, I couldn't quite explain it, but it was so, it worked for me. 
as a five-year-old <laughs> on a musical level and also uh, strangely just on a sense of humor level. And, you know, it was funny because when I was looking at, um, you know, kind of doing a bit of research on you um, and you've done so many, uh, uh, you've scored so many kids' records and kids' shows, mm -hmm. Pee Wee's Playhouse and Rugrats and Lego Movie. And yeah. it's like something about Devo and your sensibility actually like works really well for kids, kind of, doesn't it? Well, we kind of look like Fisher Price toys. <laughs> I, I could see how, you know, I think little kids kind of, when, when, when we get up close, it's a little bit scary. But when, if you're far enough away that you're looking at them on a stage, you know, it's like little kids kind of like the way Devo look. Oh, my God, yeah. And, uh, yeah, if, even if you're not paying attention to the uh, subversive, anti-authoritarian, anti-conformist, anti-corporate subject matter, it's just kind of <laughs> works in a universal way, Devo. <laughs> So, um, Saturday Night Live, and you're touring, and you make your second re record, uh, Duty Now for the Future, and um, I guess things escalate up to your third album, and then finally Whip It is, you know, a major, uh, a major radio hit. That's your first radio hit then, I guess, mm -hmm. huh? Yep. It was kind of, you know, it was, it started off as a club hit. It was back in those days, you know, oftentimes it happened that way, that where a, a DJ or somebody that was um, programming club music and uh, would determine, you know, what got played through all the clubs and then that would turn into radio play and that happened with us. Um, uh, in, in a way, I kind of liked being an art band, and uh, in a way that kind of was a double-edged sword because it put us on the radar screen at Warner Brothers where all of a sudden, you know, we'd never lost money. They'd always made money on us, but, but now they'd made big money on us because we'd traded all of our, our royalties for artistic control. You know, we'd traded away our royalties so we could you know, design our own album covers. They they, they thought we really? were really they would they negotiate they would negotiate that. Yeah, instead deal? of like instead of paying us more to do our own, they're going. Wait a minute, you're saying if we let you design your own graphics and and do your own merchandising and uh, do your own, you'll take less money. So they they just thought we were crazy. Because this, was that because you were in a you were in a. Uh, but confrontation, wanted, confrontational uh, dynamic with them over we art just, and sensibility well, and They aesthetics. just didn't understand us. I mean, right. on our first album, we went to something called a marketing meeting uh, with uh, Are We Not Men. And, and so we went in and we sat around a table with all these people at Warner Brothers. And they go, okay, here's our plan. We're going to make life-size cutouts of you guys, and we're going to put them in all the major record stores in the United States. And we're like, how much is that going to cost? And they go, $5,000, why? And we go, could we have that money so we could make a video for the song Whip, uh, Satisfaction? And they said, what would we do with that? You know, it was like, uh, right. You know, and we thought, okay, they, we don't, they don't understand who we are or what we're about. Because they weren't coming from a, a, uh, an art right. world they, sensibility. They, 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 they were, were just coming from a marketing, a corporate, company. big rock and, and roll were, record company. And they weren't, they, didn't, they weren't the visionaries. It wasn't their right. job. But, but we, once we knew that, then we thought, well, we had to protect ourselves. So that's why we started trading everything so that we could keep whatever control we could keep. And it was... Still hard. But that said, Devo really, the sound of Devo really, I mean, there were big creative leaps made, but the sound of Devo did get much more commercial, it seems to me. Um, yeah. Did I mean, that, did that we, come organically or did... did well, no, we, got, we had a lot of pressure put on us. It was like, um, once we did Whip It, then we had record company people that would started showing up that had, we'd never met before, that would show up at the recording studios and go, hey, how are you guys doing? We're like, we're fine, why? And they'd go, 
Oh, we just thought we'd come by and see what you were doing. Just wanted to make sure, uh, you know, just do anything you guys want to do. Just make sure you do another whip it, if you know what I mean. You know, and, and you know, and it was like, oh, it was God. like there was constantly that kind of a, kind of a dialogue, and we had this. It just turned into something different, sure. and, and it was like. Um, It was just, you know, it's like we were just, we were just, you know, like tortured artists. So, you know, we were trying to do the, do what we did best. And you had spent all these years with this, you know, creating this very specific, thought out aesthetic about Devo as a, as a art project, as a band. I mean, you had spent years and know each other through college. So I'm sure you didn't want to just like turn that into some, you know, the corporate makeover of Devo must have been. Well, yeah, you know, it's, um, and it's hard, you know, um, being in a band is a complicated thing and touring and, and the whole thing, just the whole experience of going through this where you're like um, an adult who's in this suspended uh you know, juvenile situation where, where you have managers and agents and uh, and uh, handlers and record companies and all these people that know what's best and are are making decisions for you and you're just kind of like um, you're feeling like you're just you know being um, you know led along and uh, you're you're on the road and then you're off the road and then you're recording the record and then you're making the film and then you're like putting together a live show and then you're rehearsing it and then you're going out on tour again and then you're coming back and you're writing 12 more songs and then you're rehearsing them and then you're recording them and then you're, you know, and it becomes a cycle. And, um, and it was, uh, there was like a lot of room for people then to internally, you know, like, uh, you know, to find dissension and to, and to um, to then like second guess everything. So and so. well, I mean, in the and that's typical. That's right. I mean, you know, I don't think there's a band that that doesn't get to enjoy the Spinal Tap side of things of being in a band. Um, but I mean, any whatever uh, the difficulty of uh, that time and the in the trajectory of Devo. I mean, what. What most certainly happened was that the work that you did influenced so many people, and I mean, still to this day, it really made such an indelible uh, impact on the culture and uh, a whole generation of rock and rollers and ah, just artists. I think artists. we were kind of part of like a, an interesting time, and I think we, we kind of, I think, we, I think you see our influence and can hear our influence out there. And then, you know, can I ask you then um, how you, uh, because you've then become such a, a brilliant and successful uh, composer for uh, film and television. I mean, you're, um, the scores for, the, for Wes Anderson's films are, are just beautiful scores. I mean, uh, you know, you, you really uh, have become such a such an innovative, brilliant composer. I mean, how, how did, do you enjoy that? How did that transition happen to you? Yeah, it was pretty easy, actually. Um, you know, it was like this cycle I was telling you about. After we'd done six or seven albums like that, where you, it, you know, you'd write 12 songs and then go through a whole year of doing this whole thing where you're doing an album, you know, recording, doing the album, doing the rehearsal for a tour, designing everything, and then you'd tour, and then you come back and start all over again. Um, uh, I, I got a call from a friend of mine, Paul Rubin, and he said, would you score my TV show? And uh, it was Pee Wee's Playhouse. And so um, I said, okay, because uh, Devo was kind, we had done a couple records with uh, Enigma Records and they were going bankrupt. They, they had had some problems. We didn't know that when we signed with them, that they were in financial trouble. And um, so... They sent me a tape on a Monday. I wrote an album's worth of music on Tuesday. I recorded it on Wednesday. 
I mailed it back to them because it was before the internet on Thursday. On Friday, they mixed it into the show. On Saturday, we watched it on TV. And on Monday, we did it again. And when he told me we're going to do that every week, I said, sign me up for this. This is great. I get to do an album every week. That just seemed like the perfect job. It seemed like the, like the dream I mean, job. Without the lyrics and the performing or the, and the, and the yeah, tension and strain lyrics. with the bandmates. Yeah, right. sometimes there was lyrics. You know, we had a theme song for the show, and, and uh, every now and then there were songs in the show. And then, and then you know, then it, it turned into doing two or three TV shows at one week, so you're juggling all sorts of stuff, and then it turned into feature films, and um, I don't know, it's, I love that. And, and I, I like to tour with the band now and then, but, but for me, it's, it, my love is writing music more than just playing the same songs again. Sure, and um, you also uh, uh, have this other career as, a, as an artist and have had over, uh, I read 150 gallery shows and a show up at the museum in contemporary art, and is that in yeah. Colorado? Or? Crazy, huh? Well, it's, it's traveling around traveling to different show. Mu museums right now. And uh, it's, it's in Minneapolis Institute of Art right now, and it'll be in uh, Cincinnati Museum in September, and it gets. It's in about three or four more museums in the U.S. before it goes to France and Germany and wow. in L.A. Europe. Is it going to? Is it? It's uh, supposed to come to Santa Monica. Yeah. So, so we'll see what happens. Santa Monica Museum no longer has a space, and so I called them about that when they lost their space, and they said, "Don't worry, we're going to do your show. We don't know where yet, but we're doing your show. So we'll see what happens. It's a year away, so we'll see. Is there uh, other uh, Cal as California artists, visual artists that, that um, are interesting to you these days, or, or the, the, that I'm a fan of? Yeah, that you're a fan of, oh, or, or just you there's know, there's a lot of there's a lot of amazing visual artists out there. Um, uh, it doesn't even know, have I'm, to be California. I, I was yeah, just curious I, who you liked. You know, I like people like Shepard Ferry and. And I like some of the older guys, like Robert Williams. Um, Robert and I, uh, I, got, I got to show with him in, in uh, Japan back in the 80s. We, we, we were part of a group of people that showed as um, California lowbrow back when they first came up with the term. So uh, we showed with George Ann Dean and, uh, and uh, Gary Panter and and uh, Neon Park when he was alive, and Big Daddy Roth showed with us uh -huh. over there, and and uh, Richard Duardo was still alive back then and showed with us, and and uh, so I don't know, I, I like our. I I just anyway, I just think um, I'm so uh, happy to talk to you. I think you're such a such a incredibly creative, interesting person, and I've been a fan since I was five years old and was in the. Saturday Night Live audience um, well, Danny, watching you do a, that, Satisfaction. That's amazing. I'm, I, the, the, the Saturday Night Live audience thing is pretty incredible. It is incredible. And you, it's more incredible if you knew what an actual impact it had on my brain, actually. And not only that, I had all the... Um, even when you were on Warner Brothers, I... You know, I had all they somehow. I had I, I I had a whole package from them with like Devo hat, Spud Boy, like potato, um, like outfits. Are there pictures of you at, at Saturday Night Live to prove that you were there? There are pictures of me at Saturday Night Live, but not maybe on that night, though. Okay. I can't say they were on I that do night. I some research on that. And, <laughs> and I have another major thing to thank you. I see what you, five years old. It's, yeah. That's pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. That was amazing. I remember it's like right before they cut to a commercial, and then they were going to come out of commercial, and, we'd, and then um, Fred Willard was going to go, oh, now, ladies and gentlemen, Devo. And uh, before he said that, um, Lorne Michaels came over and said, you're about to go on. 20 million people are going to be watching. 
don't blow it. <laughs> no. <laughs> and we're like, okay. <laughs> we'll try not to. That's funny. Um, well, you didn't. You were incredible. And I have another amazing thing to, to, to thank you for, which is that you actually saved my dog, Roy. Roy, my dog escaped in Laurel Canyon. Mark found Roy and saved him. I mean, That's um yes. I was driving my wife and called me. You didn't even know no, that it was me. I didn't know it was you. I just uh, <laughs> I just knew there was this um, dog that looked like it was coyote bait. Uh, bait. If it, if it would have been outside for another half hour. But we live in a in a part of the part of the world that looks deceptively peaceful during the day, and then at night it gets very uh, feral and um, and jungle like. So. So uh, it, my dogs were happy to have Roy come visit for a while. So they, they were happy, and my wife was, was you know, she's like a, a big crazy dog person. She was, Mark, we can't leave that dog out there. So she was, she was out of the car. I was out of my mind with anxiety and grief. And yeah. You yeah. saved Roy, and you, 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 you made Are We Not Men, We Are Devo. So thank you so much. Mark for coming on the show and uh, my pleasure and tune in next week for talk show all right I only ask if you ever see a <laughs> stupid looking pug doing the same thing